So the second half is going to focus more on the, the newer drugs. And uh, I thought it would be easier to just put the next generation of drugs, and I've decided to put three. There are other drugs, and I'm going to discuss lorlatinib uh, separately. The only reason I put these three up, uh, because the first two are approved, and brigatinib, it is expected, will be approved early part of uh, next year. Um, and so we have a lot more data about these drugs. Uh, there are other uh, ALK inhibitors. Um, I decided to put this in a table form rather than discuss each drug individually. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, please don't try to compare these numbers because um, these are independent studies. And uh, one sort of uh, dictum in uh, medical statistics is you can't do a cross-trial comparison. But it just gives you an idea about what these uh, drugs can do. Um, so uh, uh, the primary endpoint of this study, of each of these studies, were what we call as response rate. And what that means is, in how many patients did we see a shrinkage in the total tumor dimension? That is, when they measure the longest diameter of each of the lesions in the uh, in the, on the patient's scans, and they add that up, and in how many patients did that total dimension shrink at least by 30%? It's an arbitrary cutoff that has been developed just to get a sense of what the efficacy of the drug is. Um, uh, so you can have 25% shrinkage, and the patient might be feeling great, and you may have a per patient who has a 35% shrinkage and may not be feeling that great. Uh, and that doesn't mean the person who had 25% shrinkage does, did not derive benefit. But they had to pick a cutoff value to sort of uh, uh, have the ability for investigators to say how efficacious the drug is. Uh, and so the primary endpoint was response rate. And these were the response rates that were observed with uh, each of these drugs in uh, specific studies. By the way, with each of these drugs, there are more than one studies. There's a specific reason why I've chosen particular studies to represent the data regarding uh, these drugs. The other important thing is that they do work in the brain. It may appear that electinib and brigatinib works better in the brain than uh, seritinib. One important thing was that when they developed the study, they really didn't prospectively look for brain responses in the seritinib study. Seritinib was one of the first drugs to be developed, and so we were still learning about uh, how beneficial these drugs can be in the brain. Um, so, um, uh, it was, uh, I think the experience with seritinib uh, got the folks who developed electinib, brigatinib a little more smart, and so they were able to uh, prospectively look for uh, what the benefit was in the brain. And this, the PFS indicates how long was the tu uh, tumor controlled, and it does appear that the um, uh, duration of control is somewhat longer with brigatinib, but again, you should not be comparing these numbers because these were independent trials. What I just wanted to give you a, a sense is, this is a second ALK inhibitor after these patients had already had Zalkari, and in many of these patients, almost 70 to 80% of these patients, these had already received chemotherapy, maybe even a couple of different chemotherapies. And despite that, so this was their probably third or fourth drug that were get, they were getting, and despite that, you had benefit. In general, what has been seen even with these drugs is that the later line, the later time point you use it in, so you use it after chemotherapy and trisotinib, the benefit appears to be somewhat less as opposed to if you gave it after crizotinib and these patients had not received chemotherapy. That just, again, uh, observation from the data that's not based on any sort of randomized data where patients got crizotinib and then were given a drug like electinib or seritinib or got crizotinib and got chemo and then got electinib and seritinib. Nonetheless, it appears to make sense that the earlier you start them, the better these drugs are going to work. Now, the main distinguishing feature are the side effects. Uh, so I think from an efficacy point of view, for the most part, the drugs work about the same. Uh, maybe the progression-free survival of brigatinib stands out. Um, but overall, I think at the present time, based on what we know, 
I, I feel that the efficacy is about the same. I think the differences are the side effects. And one of the important distinguishing features of serotonin is that the side effect profile appears to be a little bit more than uh, seen with the other drugs, particularly what we call as GI toxicity, the nausea, vomiting, and the diarrhea. It can be managed, and just yesterday in my clinic, I saw a lady who has been on uh, 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 Zycadia or Serotinib for almost 22 months. Uh, she is at a lower dose than the standard approved dose of 750 milligrams once a day. She is on 450 milligrams once a day, but is doing extremely well. Virtually has no side effects from the drug, and her scans look wonderful. Uh, as I said, I just saw her yesterday. Uh, so it can be managed, but the GI toxicity rate does appear to be higher with serotonin. Electinib is a well-tolerated drug. Um, I hate to mention this right before lunchtime, but one of the side effects that you can see with this drug is constipation. It's not a common thing. I can tell you I have a patient whose images I'm going to show. Um, I, I, he's doing well, and after two and a half years, I found out that he was so constipated once that he had to go to the emergency room. And so what happens sometimes with these patients who are doing well is it becomes more of a social visit. He's from Cleveland, so I would talk about the Cavs and the fun fantastic playoff run they had this year, and I used to forget that I'm actually seeing a patient. What I'm just trying to tell you is even the patients sometimes forget that some of the symptoms they are experiencing because they've been on the drug for a long time could be related uh, to the drug. So just be mindful if you see, notice something new, something that is bothering you, it potentially could be related to the drug that you're on. Uh, brigatinib is well tolerated. By the way, I've highlighted this. This is a, from a presentation I did at ASCO. This is because it w I was discussing brigatinib data. I don't want, to, don't want to give you the impression that this is a lot more high than in brigatinib patients than uh, with the other drugs. One thing that is seen with the brigatinib patients is you can have in, uh, uh, in about 5% of the patients, you can have this uh, episode where you may develop shortness of breath and coughing. It tends to occur within 48 hours to seven days of starting the drug. The exact mechanism is not clear. But in a, almost all of these such patients, you can, uh, the, the episode resolves if you, if you stop the drug. And eventually, you can, in almost all of them, uh, go up to the standard dose. But beca because what they notice is these events occurred at a higher dose, they the, the way the drug uh, is being developed is you start at only 90 milligrams first. And if you do OK at the 90 milligrams and, and don't develop any severe lung uh, toxicity, severe shortness of breath, or severe cough, then you go up to 180. I personally have never treated a patient with brigatinib. We are about to start a brigatinib expanded access program. But wonderful experts like Dr. Ross Kamage, Dr. Corey Langer, a couple of other folks who have an extensive experience with brigatinib don't think this is, a, this is a major issue. But one just needs to be mindful about it and also needs to be mindful about the dosing once the drug gets approved. But they're going to give it for 90 milligrams for the first week and then go up to 180 milligrams. I just thought of showing a scan. Part of the reason is just to sort of uh, change the dynamic of the talk. Uh, the reason to show the scan is not to show good scans. There are patients who do, don't benefit when they go on the second drug. But the reason was that you can see benefit that is as long as, you, as the patient derived benefit on Zalkari or sometimes uh, even longer. This is a patient who I started treating in January of 2013. Um, he, and I don't know how well this shows, but I don't know whether you see these multiple dark spots uh, in the liver. These are all liver metastases. And one of them was biopsied for the purposes of this study. Uh, this is a scan two and a half years later. And as you can see, there is virtually no spot seen in a liver. I will, I'm not kidding. I was treating this patient, uh, I, I'm still treating this patient, and I actually had forgotten that the patient had diagnosis at liver meds. Because what happened is about three years into his treatment on electinib, he developed a spot in the liver, 
And then when I went back to his story, because we were deciding whether we were going to zap that lesion because that was the only lesion that was growing, that's when I remember, oh, this patient, because even on the first scan that we did after his electinib, his liver looked normal. Why I'm showing you this is you can have this amount of disease, and we never used to see this with chemotherapy, and you can, in at least some patients, completely clear it. And the other issue with the, all these drugs, and again, this is an electinib patient, but this has been reported with seritinib, this has been reported with brigatinib. A wonderful lady who unfortunately is not with us anymore, uh, well, I, I first um, saw her in 2012, uh, uh, um, and she had been uh, known to be an ALK positive patient for over three years, and she was diagnosed with brain mets at the time of diagnosis, had undergone gamma knife a couple of times, but then had developed, this is leptomeningeal metastases, and I'm sure at least some of you know, so you have brain metastases that is within the brain tissue, and then the brain is covered by what is called as meninges, and the cancer can spread to the meninges, and you can have leptomeningeal metastases. And it's one side of metastases that all us doctors really, really dread, because these me leptomeningeal metastases are even harder to treat than brain metastases, and, and patients can have devastating complications from these metastases, and uh, it is very, very difficult to treat uh, with any of the treatments, even with brain radiation, even with uh, chemotherapy. Now, um, so this patient had developed brain, uh, leptomeningeal metastases. She had other brain metastases, and within six weeks, I don't know, again, how well this clears up, but you see this white area, you cannot see it anymore, same thing here. There was complete clearance of her leptomeningeal metastases. She, has, she unfortunately passed away a year and a half after she started on the electinib trial. But what was to some degree gratifying, there's no way you can derive satisfaction from the fact that the patient eventually did pass away. But the, what was gratifying as an investigator is that she never suffered from the consequences of leptomeningeal metastases. Uh, and, though, and those uh, can be quite devastating. This remained a, a, a radiologic finding uh, and was never a clinical consequence for her before she passed away. The other drug that is now coming on is lorlatinib, and what lorlatinib is trying to do is trying to see if it can provide further ALK inhibitor benefit. That is, the chances of an ALK inhibitor benefiting after you have already gone through two ALK inhibitor is going to be less because the likelihood that the tumor is not only going to depend on ALK, but is going to depend on other molecules for its survival, for its ability to metastasize is going to be high. And so just having a drug that targets ALK inhibitor is going to be less likely to be effective. Nonetheless, they've developed a drug that does appear to have some activity. This is data presented at ASCO. Would like you to focus on this group of patients. These are patients who had at least received two ALK inhibitors. Some of them had received more than ALK inhibitor three times, but had not necessarily received more than two distinct ALK inhibitors. So some of them had gone through Zalkari a couple of times and then had got another ALK inhibitor. Uh, uh, and even in those patients, now only 26 patients. So very small number of patients, uh, but of those, about 11 had this uh, response rate. So doesn't mean only 11 benefited another five had stable disease, that is the cancer that was growing when you gave this drug was stable at least a period of time, suggesting that this drug could be beneficial in patients who have had up to two ALK inhibitors uh, before. Um, this is very, very early data. There is uh, an ongoing study that we are participating in it, and really that uh, study will define how effective this drug is in patients who have had two ALK inhibitors, but just to provide you a sense that there is a possibility that a third ALK inhibitor may provide benefit at least to a proportion of patients. Um, this is uh, 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 actually a Dr. Alice Shaw patient uh, who had already gone through uh, uh, crizotinib, seritinib, and electinib. So this patient had gone through three ALK inhibitors, not just two, and on lorlatinib had benefit as you can see, this is the tumor, and this uh, shows shrinkage. 
and apparently at least at the time of June was when ASCO was held and June when this presentation was made from May 24, uh, four, May 14, 2015 when the patient started, uh, the April uh, 2015 when the patient started, the patient was still on lorlatinib. So this patient at least derived benefit uh, 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 with lorlatinib being the fourth uh, ALK inhibitor. I think um, my sense is that the number of patients that we are going to treat uh, with a, a third ALK inhibitor or fourth, fourth ALK inhibitor is going to be relatively small because I suspect that in those patients, you really are going to try and define what is the mechanism of resistance. And if you identified a specific mechanism of resistance and you knew that a specific drug worked in the tumor that had that specific mechanism of resistance, that is the one where you're going to use a third and fourth ALK inhibitor. What I mean by that is, right now what we are doing is if patient gets Zalkari and the patient progresses, we are going to the second ALK inhibitor without any specific testing. My suspicion is, though there is data now for using, I have myself used uh, seritinib after electinib after they had had crizotinib. So I have done crizotinib, seritinib, electinib. I have done crizotinib, uh, serit, uh, electinib, seritinib. But that is because uh, there were trials that were available. My suspicion is if you don't have a specific mutation, specific uh, alteration in the tumor that you know that the third or the fourth ALK inhibitor is going to target, the likelihood of benefit from randomly using uh, another ALK inhibitor is likely to be less. Of course, I have to say that the lorlatinib study suggested that all, of the 26 patients, almost half of them derived benefit. So I have to be cautious about that, but that was just 26 patients. So my take, based on all the data we have available, is my suspicion is, uh, and I'm not suggesting one shouldn't try a third ALK inhibitor, but I think we are going to be a lot more smarter if we try to define what the mechanism of resistance is. And if you identify a specific mechanism of resistance, then use the drug that is targeting that mechanism of resistance uh, before uh, just randomly using a, a, another ALK inhibitor. Um, this was mentioned in the morning, and, and uh, Dr. Ch uh, uh, Chad just mentioned that you can consider, depending upon the type of progression you have, you can consider local therapy. Uh, and this we used to do before we had ALK inhibitors, uh, other ALK inhibitors a lot when patients were on Zalkari. So if patients on Zalkari developed brain met or developed an isolated area of met, we used to radiate that or do surgery to extend the duration on which the Zalkari patient, uh, the patient could stay on Zalkari. I'm just going to quickly go back to the patient I told you on electinib who started in January of 2013. In uh, January of uh, 2015, uh, he developed, he had already been treated with whole brain radiation in the past. Uh, he had developed some brain meds when we started on electinib that did respond. In January of 2015, he developed a single brain met that was appeared to be growing. So that was treated with uh, gamma knife. He continued on electinib. In January of 2016, he developed a liver met we did a PET scan, brain scan, everything else was negative. Because he had an isolated liver met, we uh, did uh, something like gamma knife, it's called SBRT, that, that uh, Chad mentioned, to the liver lesion. But more recently, within the last one month, he had some other areas of progression. He had a couple of other liver mets, a couple of bone mets, and so we just switched him to the lorlatinib uh, trial uh, since then. So he started on lorlatinib. What I'm trying to suggest, show, tell you is that both with the first generation ALK inhibitors and second generation ALK inhibitors, if you have uh, specific areas that have progressed, just isolated areas, one or two, um, how many, it is something that you have to decide based on what makes sense. What I can tell you is if the patient has had long benefit I'm much more inclined when the patient does develop isolated progression to consider a, a localized therapy such as surgery or radiation. What I mean by that is this patient started in January of 2013. If the patient had developed two liver mets by say April of 2013, my enthusiasm to do localized therapy would be somewhat less because the likelihood if within three months the patient has developed 
two new brain, uh, liver metastases that the patient did not have at the time of the uh, start of electinib, the likelihood that there are other metastases that you just don't know of and that are going to pop up uh, is a lot higher. And so the benefit that the patient is going to draw from uh, doing localized therapy is far less. The reason we were willing to do the gamma knife on the brain was because this was two years later. So the hope was that the, all the other areas of disease, not to, uh, this was not because, we did, we, don't, we did not do gamma knife because we felt this was the only area of cancer. We knew the patient does have other areas of cancer, but those areas of cancer are controlled. And so the likelihood that they will remain controlled on electinib for a good period of time was long enough, and therefore we did the gamma knife. Again, this is where um, the multidisciplinary tumor boards that, that was mentioned in the morning, and this is where being sure that you're approaching this and not just uh, doing this in every patient is important. So selectivity is very important when we consider a localized therapy, but that can definitely provide benefit to the patients. And another thing that I want to mention is chemotherapy. I know that ALK patients particularly, I feel more than even EGFR patients, really feel like they've lost the battle if their doctor recommends chemotherapy. They feel that means they have no hope. I do want to mention there's data that pemetrexate, which is a, or Alimta, is a chemotherapy that we use routinely in non-small cell lung cancer, and there's data to suggest that it may have preferential activity in ALK positive uh, tumors as compared to other non-small cell lung cancers. In fact, the first report of such selective activity of pemetrexate in ALK positive lung cancer was generated at the University of Colorado. This is from the second line trial of crizotinib. This is the data where crizotinib showed it was better than chemotherapy, but what I did not mention is you, the patients who were randomized to chemotherapy, the treating physicians had a choice. They could use taxotere or alimta, and if you break down the benefit in patients, you can see this is the benefit from patients who got zalkari, but these are the patients who got Alimta, and as you can see, the patients who got Alimta or Pemetrexate did better than the patients who got Taxotere. What I'm trying to say is, I wonder, especially when you're talking about a fourth ALK inhibitor, if you don't know of a specific mutation, I don't know as of now whether it would be smarter to go to chemotherapy than to keep persisting with, with the ALK inhibitor. Uh, I feel strongly about fourth. I don't know about third, especially with the lorlatinib uh, data. But I do want to say, don't think that if you were recommended chemotherapy, that means uh, you know there is no hope. I will also say that there is a wonderful case report by Dr. Alice Shaw. I seem to be mentioning Alice a lot today. Uh, at December of last year, where patients, uh, one of our patients got um, uh, chemotherapy first, got Zalkari, got, I believe, Zycadia, then progressed, got Lorlatinib, got more chemotherapy, and then progressed again, and they biopsied the patient at that progression. So she had gone through, this individual had gone through almost five, six different treatment, and interestingly, the mutation that the patient had at that time was actually sensitive to Zalkari. So the patient was restarted on Zalkari. I wouldn't do that randomly, but what I'm trying to suggest is chemotherapy could be a tool to control the cancer for a period of time till further options pop up. So don't view chemotherapy as, you know, oh, it's all over now and, and nothing can be done. I'm not suggesting that's how patients view it, but patients get extremely disappointed, especially when they've gone to two, three different ALK inhibitors, and then you say, maybe we should use uh, chemotherapy. And finally, there's a lot of buzz about immune therapy. And I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes about this. Uh, technically, our immune system, any patient's immune system should be able to recognize the cancer and eliminate the cancer. However, cancers fool the immune system into thinking they are normal tissue, and therefore the patient's own immune system cannot recognize the cancer and cannot launch an effective uh, immune attack. One of the ways, not the only way, one of the ways lung cancers can fool the immune system is that in all of our, all our immune cells express a molecule called PD-1. Some cancers express a molecule called PDL1. Sorry, PDL1. When an immune cell come close to, comes close to a cancer cell, the PDL1 on the cancer cell 
can bind to PD-1, and that sends a signal to the immune cell, hey, I'm a good guy, don't attack me. So by this interaction, the immune cell feels this is not something that is to be attacked. So there are companies that have developed drugs that block off PD-1 on the immune cell. So now when the immune cell comes close to the cancer cell, the PD-L1 on the cancer cell cannot interact with the PD-1 on the immune cell. And so now the cancer cannot send a signal to the immune cell, hey, I'm a good guy. Now the immune cell can recognize the cancer cell and attack the cancer cell. So there are two drugs that are approved as of now, and there are other drugs that are in development that, that do this, that is block off the PD-1 on the immune cell. One is nivolumab or Obdivo, the other is pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And what this study showed was, this was a study that was conducted in patients who had gone through chemotherapy. These were not just ALK patients, these were any non-small cell lung cancer patients. They had got chemotherapy, they had developed progression, and they were randomized to Obdivo or chemotherapy, which was docetaxel, which is the standard second line uh, treatment. Uh, and what the reason this uh, uh, um, uh, drug was approved was that the patients who received Obdivo overall had a longer survival than what the patients who got chemotherapy. Now what is important to recognize is that not everybody benefits with Obdivo. The reason there is, a, or for that matter with Keytruda, the reason there's excitement about these drugs is when they work, they work for a very long period of time. That is, I have now patients who are stage four who had gone through multiple chemotherapies, who've got one of these drugs, they received it for a couple of years, and now I've stopped their drugs, and I don't see any evidence of disease, and they're off their drugs for a long period of time. This does not happen in a majority of patients. In fact, it happens in only about 10% of the patients, and the drug overall benefits only in 15 to 20% of the patients. But the reason the survival advantage was seen is when they work, they control the cancer for a much longer period of time than we see with chemotherapy. However, they don't work equally in all patients. And one of the groups of patients that they don't work very well is in never smokers. So if you look at the benefit, there was no greater benefit with these immune therapy drugs than with uh, chemotherapy in the never smokers. Now I mentioned to you that you can have ALK in patients who are former smokers or current smokers, but usually it is seen in never smokers. The hypothesis, and this is not confirmed, the hypothesis that this class of drugs don't as of now work very well in never smokers is because the number of mutations that have caused the cancer in never smokers is far lower than the number of mutations that have caused the cancer in smokers. And I hope that that uh, is understood. Why is that important in terms of these tumors working? When you have a number of mutations, even though all the mutations may not be relevant for the cancer cells to grow and spread, when you have a number of mutations, they tend to, those tumors tend to express on their surface proteins or substances that are distinct from the proteins or substances that are present on normal tissue. Our immune system is geared to identifying normal tissue so that it doesn't attack it and attacks only foreign tissue. When you have a tumor that has a lot more mutations, it expresses proteins or substances on its surface that are very different from normal substances that are present on normal tissue. So the ability of the immune system to recognize the cancer is far better. Because the number of mutations in a never smoker are lower, the number of substances that are distinct from self are lower. And so the ability of the immune system to recognize that tumor as distinct, as foreign, as something to be attacked is a lot less. This is not to say these drugs don't work in EGFR mutation or have positive patients. It's just that the probability of these drugs working as single agents is far lower. And therefore, this would not be my go-to drug in the second, for that matter, in the third. And I would say I would use Alimta before I use this drug. The other reason why these drugs may be something that you want to use more down the line 
is because it is possible, and this is just pure speculation on my part, that I mentioned to you earlier, the longer the tumor survives, it acquires multiple mutations. And so if it acquires multiple mutations, it is more likely to express the longer the patient has survived molecules that are distinct, substances on the surface that are distinct from self. So the ability of the immune system to recognize it would be easier. That is pure speculation on my part, never been proven, but that is another reason. So what I want to say is, I'm, I hope I'm not giving you the message that one should not use Obdivo in ALK positive patients. What I'm just saying is I would use a second generation ALK inhibitor, maybe even a third ALK inhibitor, maybe even chemotherapy before I go to the immune therapy, though this remains. And when I say immune therapy, I mean this class of drugs. Uh, it should, it's uh, in a way wrong on my part to say immune therapy. There's several other types of immune therapies that are being looked at. This is one type of uh, immune therapy that is approved for lung cancer. And this is to show you that there are multiple substances present on T cells, some that downregulate the T cell or the immune cell, some that upregulate the uh, immune cell. So what we are doing now is now that these Obdivo and Keytruda-like drugs have shown benefit, we are doing combination uh, immune therapy. As you know, when we do chemotherapy, many times we do carboplatin and alimta. The reason we do a combination chemotherapy is because the chemotherapy drugs work against the cancer in distinct ways. So you're attacking the cancer in a couple of different ways. The same concept is here. If you used a drug that uh, inhibits the molecule that downregulates uh, the immune cell, and combine it with a drug that upregulates a molecule that enhances the activity of T cell. If you gave a combination of that, the chance that you are going to uh, activate the patient's immune system to recognize and fight the cancer is going to be better. I hope I was able to uh, uh, discuss that properly. And so in EGFR and ALK patients, I have now started enrolling them on clinical trials where we are doing combo immune therapy drugs where one drug is an Obdivo or Keytruda-like drug, and the other drug is a drug that is trying to... Uh, so the way we look at this is the Obdivo or Keytruda-like drugs are like releasing the brake on the immune system. And then now you have some experimental drugs that are pushing on the accelerator. And so by releasing the brake and pushing on the accelerator, the hope is that your ability to activate the patient's immune system to recognize and... Uh, the tumor and then launch a tumor attack is going to be a greater. And so usually what I've done is in EGFR and ALK patients, instead of giving them single agent Obdivo or Keytruda, I prefer to do uh, the combo uh, immune therapy trials and that is only after they've gone through um, uh, several, uh, these other ALK inhibitors and maybe even uh, chemotherapy. So this is sort of to summarize what we discussed about at least how I have started choosing. So after patients progress on Zalkari, uh, we have one of these. Right now, these two drugs are approved. One expects Brigatinib will be approved early part of this year. Uh, but also, I just want to make you aware, there is a Brigatinib expanded access protocol uh, that is going to be started soon. And that will allow patients who have had even two or three ALK inhibitors. So that is an option. But brigatinib is an approved drug one expects early part of next year. After two ALK inhibitors, you do have now data with lorlatinib. The lorlatinib uh, a, a study cohort for patients who have had two ALK inhibitors is closed. But there are other lorlatinib studies that are likely to be approved, so one can look for those. I think the better approach would be to do mutation testing after they've had two ALK inhibitors. And if you identified a specific mutation such as G1202R, then go to lorlatinib. It appears brigatinib may also work against G1202R. Don't forget chemotherapy. And immune therapy is definitely an option, but I would prefer to enroll them on a combo immune therapy trial rather than the single agent of Devo or Keytruda. And then if you have localized progression, whether it's after a while on the first ALK inhibitor or second ALK inhibitor, uh, one can consider uh, localized therapy such as surgery or radiation. To finish up, I just wanted to briefly talk about 
J. Alex, I don't know, some of you may be aware. As I mentioned to you, electinib, uh, all these drugs, electinib, seritinib, and uh, brigadinib, appear to be more potent ALK inhibitors than Zalkari. And so there is now interest, instead of using them after patients have progressed on Zalkari, would you derive more benefit if you started them on one of, the, one of these drugs as the first ALK inhibitor as opposed to Zalkari? And th there, were, there were two studies conducted. The first study was in Japan. There is a worldwide study called ALEX. So the Jap Japanese study was called J-ALEX. By the way, ALEX stands for Electinib versus Zalkari. They always come up with these cute names uh, to make people remember. So J-ALEX is Japanese ALEX, and the worldwide ALEX was just called simple ALEX. So these patients were newly diagnosed. ALK inhibitors, they were randomized to electinib or crizotinib or zalkari. And what this study showed was that the electinib uh, controlled, uh, shrank the tumor and controlled the tumor for a longer period of time than what was seen with uh, zalkari. Um, what was very striking, um, oh, this is not shown up very well, I apologize. What was very striking is that in patients who had brain meds, uh, the benefit was significant. That is, um, there was almost, um, uh, uh, it was much more better than patients, the overall benefit rate. And the feeling is that is because the brain med control with electinib was better than with uh, Zalkari. There were some differences in toxicity. In general, electinib was better tolerated. But I need to warn you that uh, in general, the rate of toxicities with Zalkari in Japanese patients is somewhat higher than what has been reported with Zalkari in other uh, parts of the world. And so it is possible that this difference in toxicity that was seen may be because this was in Japanese patients. Uh, so I had the privilege of discussing these results at ASCO, and so one of the questions was, would this uh, lead you to change uh, your standard of care? What was interesting is while I was preparing my presentation in May of this year, I diagnosed my first ALK patient this year, a 41-year-old lady who uh, is from uh, India, never smoker, came in with significant pain, shortness of breath, and we had to really admit her. Uh, she had a fluid around her heart, she had pericardial effusion, she had multiple bone mets uh, because of which she was having pain. Uh, she was put on pain medication, she got confused, so she landed up having a brain scan and she had multiple small brain metastases. And interestingly, I was reviewing this data while I had this patient uh, in the hospital. We found out that she was ALK positive and I actually uh, approached her insurance for uh, electinib and they did approve it. I don't know if every insurance will approve it. Um, because of the extensive nature of her disease and because of the brain meds that she had, I decided to use electinib um, uh, over crizotinib because I knew of the JLX data. I will say this, if I had seen this patient six months ago, say December of 2015, when I was not familiar with this data, I would have still probably gone with Zalkari. This is what, as the data emerges, we do change our uh, treatment approach. Now, just because you saw the tumor was controlled for a longer period of time, does this mean you really derive better benefit? This is what Dr. West was mentioning about this progression-free survival. Really, you would make an impact if, by starting electinib, you were deriving greater benefit than what you would if you started with crizotinib and then at progression did electinib. If you're going to get the same benefit, then you really have not made an advancement. What I can tell you is this is now really massaging the data, so you have to view this with a huge level of caution. But if you look, look at the average duration of control with crizotinib, and it is used as the first ALK inhibitor, and the average duration of control with electinib as a second ALK inhibitor, it appears that the total average is about 20 months. In j -Alex, the study that was reported at ASCO, the control with electinib was far greater than 20 months. And so this data suggests we need, we need the worldwide Alex data to really be certain of this. But this data suggests that you may have a better benefit by starting off el electinib uh, than with crizotinib. And this may be true of the other second generation ALK inhibitors. The other concern is 
What do you do if you start with electinib? Do you limit your options? Right now, you know you start with Zalkari, then you have the option of Siritinib, Electinib, Brigatinib, then you could do Lorlatinib. Would you limit your options if you started with Electinib? Because we don't have good data as to what these other drugs do. At least in the laboratory, you know that if the patient develops resistance to Electinib, there are drugs that, so if, this, if a patient develops resistance and the patient has this mutation, Seritinib appears to be sensitive. If the patient has G12O2R, um, lorlatinib uh, can work. So with the availability of all these drugs, it is possible to use a second ALK inhibitor, even if you started off with electinib. Uh, but again, we need clinical data. This is just based on laboratory setting. But this concern that what would you do after the patient progressed on electinib does uh, make certain feel hesitant about making the switch from Zalkari to electinib as the first uh, ALK inhibitor. And these are some of the suggestions what one would do if you did start with electinib. Of course, you could use lorlatinib or brigatinib. Again, I think mutation testing is important. And then you could do chemotherapy uh, or immune therapy. Yes, are we coming to the end? Some questions, okay. The only last part was going to be about stage three, early stage. I really talked mainly about stage four. What I can briefly say is, write this right now. In early stage lung cancer, we don't have data to show that uh, uh, after surgery or adjuvant chemotherapy, giving ALK inhibitors necessarily improves survival. There's a large study going on called Al Alchemist uh, in the US. Uh, that is randomizing patients who are ALK positive after surgery and chemotherapy to either getting Zalkari or getting placebo with the hope of finding out would, if you treated early stage lung cancer patients who are ALK positive, would you derive uh, greater benefit? That data is not yet available. And then there are also studies in stage three lung cancer. Stage three is cancer that has already spread to the middle of the chest, either to the lymph nodes or direct extension. And in those patients, there are different studies that are looking at incorporating uh, Zalkari into uh, the treatment paradigm of chemotherapy and radiation, not necessarily along with it, but either before or after it. So there are trials going on uh, right now. It is hard to say in early stage lung cancer whether I would do it routinely. I think it would be a case-to-case -case basis, would really make an effort to enroll those patients on these trials. Sorry, uh, I, I, I do have a tendency to keep talking, but I would be really glad to take any questions. Okay, I have a number of questions okay. here. And then I just wanted to add one comment um, anecdotally about the number of ALK inhibitors you take, because I'm on my third ALK inhibitor now, lorlotinib. And interestingly, I have had a more sustained response on this one than the previous two. So I, I always say, think possible, not probable. Yes. No, I completely agree. All right, so the first question is, how common is flare after stopping, pausing elk inhibition, and how quickly does it typically occur? So I will tell you that um, I think it is in the range of only about 15 to 20%. Um, I will tell you, I saw this most uh, when I was doing the electinib trial, where the way the study was designed was that they had to come off the Zalkari for about a week, and then uh, they would get electinib only for one day, and then you had to wait for five days for testing, for three or four days for testing ECGs, blood work, and all that, and only then you could start the electinib. And I can tell you, during those seven, eight days, the patients definitely became more symptomatic. Was that necessarily a fair flare, or was it that their tumor was already growing and now that they were not on active treatment, uh, they were having more symptoms uh, is unclear. Uh, in only one of those patients, I did a scan for a, a, a specific reason before they got the electinib, and there was worsening of the disease compared to a scan that had been done 10 days before. Within 10 days, usually lung cancer doesn't grow. And so that is what tells you that probably there were tumors that were still being controlled by Zalkari. This has been much more documented with EGFR, but it does occur. My sense is about 15% of the patients. For a Zalkari refractory patient, 
if no resistant mutations are found, is there any way to figure out mechanism of resistance? For example, can we rule out EGFR activation somehow? So yes, that has been documented. These other pathways have been documented. I think there are two aspects of this. One is um, what we don't know as of now, or we don't have good data about it, is in the laboratory we have, but not in the clinic, is let's say you identify a specific pathway that is activated, and that is now what, a different pathway other than the ALK that is activated, and that is what is making the cancer resistant to the ALK inhibitor. Would inhibiting that pathway necessarily provide benefit? We have data about that in the laboratory. That's what the laboratory data suggests, but that experiment has not been done, though such trials are about to be started. But what is interesting is, and this has been shown in laboratory as well is, that you really get the best benefit if you give a drug that blocks that pathway, that alternative pathway that has been upregulated with the ALK inhibitor. So the tumor continues to have some dependency on ALK. So if you just gave her the drug that blocks that alternative pathway that has emerged as the mechanism of resistance, you don't see as much of an anti-tumor effect. So uh, the somewhere, and this is where I mentioned to you that even in tumors where they have, may have developed a completely different resistance mechanism, they continue to have a certain level of ALK dependency. And so uh, the trials that are being uh, planned and that are going to be conducted are going to look at if you identified a different path inhibitor pathway that is the mechanism of resistance, it's not just going to be targeting that pathway, but giving uh, the, it with the ALK inhibitor. How much of a concern is seritinib in diabetic patients? Are there any specific strategy strategies to prevent and manage hyperglycemia in type 1 patients on seritinib? So it is definitely mentioned in the package insert that seritinib can cause uh, high blood glucose levels. Seritinib can inhibit a molecule called IGF-1R. IGF also means insulin-like growth factor. And so when you block that insulin-like growth factor, you uh, get high glucose levels. And this is much more likely to happen in uh, diabetics. I personally don't know of how a type 1 diabetic would be managed. And the reason that that's important is most individuals, when they have diabetes, it's type 2. In type 2, you real, uh, the problem is that there is relative insulin deficiency. Insulin is a hormone that we all have that controls glucose levels. And it's not that the patient with type 2 diabetes is not producing insulin, it just is not as effective. And so you give drugs to compensate for the lack of effectiveness of insulin. Whereas in type 1, the insulin levels are low. What uh, Zycadia can cause is ineffectiveness on insulin. So if you, you can't use insulin in those patients because uh, uh, when they do develop Zycadia, patients develop hyperglycemia because it's not going to be very effective. So you have to give drugs like metformin, and there's several other drugs that are available that can be managed in type 2. In type 1, I think what would need to be done, and I'm purely speculating, I've now never come across this situation, and I don't know if there are case reports, but you would maintain them on whatever their insulin therapy is, but in addition, add these other drugs to overcome the effect of hyperglycemia. In my opinion, if I have that situation with the availability of these other drugs, I would frankly take them off the Zycadia and switch them to another ALK inhibitor because the other ALK inhibitors are not, not, to, not known to cause hyperglycemia because they don't inhibit this IGF-1R. Is there any information, even anecdotal or preclinical, on combining ALK inhibitors with PD-1 inhibitors for example, the trial of seritinib and nivolumab. How do you say that? Nivol nivolumab. Anything on toxicity or efficacy yet? So no data. So as I mentioned, these PD-1 inhibitors have not been found to be very effective on their own in these group of patients, both EGFR and ALK. So both in EGFR and ALK, uh, there has been an interest in combining an EGFR or ALK inhibitor with these PD-1 drugs with the hope 
that you shrink the tumor and then activate the immune system and then the immune system can take care of whatever is left behind so that the resistance doesn't emerge. Let me say this, that at least in EGFR, the strategy, the initial report suggests that the strategy has not provided meaningful benefit. Now, um, I'm less familiar with what the data is in ALK. My suspicion, based on what we have seen in EGFR, is that purely this PD-1 plus ALK inhibitor strategy may not be that beneficial or may be beneficial in a select group of patients. That doesn't mean that other immune therapy drugs that are being developed, if combined with ALK inhibitor, won't be beneficial. But I'm not too optimistic in a broad group of patients that this strategy is going to be beneficial. Um, as far as toxicity is concerned, uh, as best as I know, no specific toxicity concerns when you combine these drugs with the ALK inhibitors, but I will say that in EGFR patients, there's a drug that we use called osimertinib. That's the second drug that we use in EGFR patients. So like your electinib sedative in the ALK field, osimertinib or Tagriso is your second drug. And at least there's some reports where when Tagriso was combined with Obdivo or uh, Keytruda-like drugs, that they had seen increased lung toxicity. Uh, but that was something seen only with that drug, it's not been reported with the other EGFR blockers, whether you would see some, these, those kind of um, um, unexpected toxicities remains to be seen. What about, now I don't know what this is, I think it's x -coveries, X396, how does it compare, compare to <laughs> Brigatinib, yeah. yeah. So as I mentioned, I listed only three ALK inhibitors, but there are other ALK inhibitors, and one of them is excovery drug. I don't know if it has a very specific distinguishing feature. So uh, one of the distinguishing features of lorlatinib is it can block G1202R, one of the mutations, and to which electinib cannot work, seritinib cannot work in the lab. Even brigatinib can work as G G1202R. Excovery doesn't have a very specific, as best as I'm aware of, of a distinguishing feature. And I can't tell you what the role will, it will be. I suspect it will be as effective as some of these other drugs, such as electinib, brigatinib. Whether it will necessarily provide a distinct advantage, I'm not certain. OK. Sorry, and they need to come back here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.